Evening, John. Ken, tonight's question is a real doozy. If a person does not accept Jesus, is he automatically doomed to hell? Uh, John, that's an awesome question, and um, obviously the whole uh, foundation of evangelical Christianity rests on uh, the answer to that question. We're going to investigate uh, uh, specifically the scripture in uh, recorded of Jesus in recorded in John 14:6 that addresses that issue, and then we'll develop uh, what Jesus was talking about tonight to address that issue. Maybe we could start, John, by you reading that scripture. I think most people would know it, but uh, we'll read it for completion. Okay, sake. John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Okay, so evangelicals use that last phrase, no one comes to the Father except by me, uh, to establish uh, their position that uh, accepting Jesus is essential to uh, going to heaven or avoiding going to hell. That is, whatever exists beyond this present life being accepted in that uh, by God is, is essential. You, to do so, you must accept Jesus because he's the way. Uh, okay. uh, no one can come to the Father uh, otherwise. Now, what we want to challenge tonight is, uh, is indeed, that's what Jesus was talking about, was that his mindset, his intention to communicate uh, when he made that statement. And so that's, that's what we're going to attempt to investigate. Okay, and our desire tonight is to uh, challenge you to look at these scriptures and investigate them for yourselves. I want to then read another scripture that goes along with that. It's John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. We just want to look at that word obey there for a second, Ken. In Greek, it's apothes, uh, and it literally means to uh, reject to willfully uh, reject uh, a revelation. Uh, now, so that's not someone who just doesn't know or hasn't had that revelation. It's someone who rejects that revelation. Okay, so there's some latitude in interpretation of that scripture. Well, let's go on to Acts chapter 4. There's another statement there paralleling uh, the scripture in John 14, 6, and uh, four, uh, 336 that John just read, that appears to, appears to point in the same direction. So okay. if you would read that one. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, there again, if we look at that word saved or salvation, it's soterian, it means... Uh, deliverance from molestation of the enemy. Okay, so, so again, we can look at the specific word structure in these scriptures and perhaps raise a question as to exactly what might be meant. But if we take these scriptures and let them stand alone uh, without comparing them to other uh, parts of biblical revelation, they would, they would basically appear to uh, uh, point to the typical Christian interpretation of them that one must accept Jesus in order to go to heaven and avoid going to hell. They will appear to say that. Now, uh, uh, that and and that obviously provides the foundation that we see uh, in Christian doctrine. In Christian doctrines, the so-called church fathers in Cyprian around 250 A.D said things like, uh, there is no salvation outside of the church. So uh, therefore, if you're not in the church, you're going to hell. Augustine, uh, about a couple of hundred years later, picks up on this, and he talks about the absolute depravity of man. Based on Genesis, the Genesis account, you're born separate from God, therefore you're born going to hell. And th so, Ken, this has been uh, cemented in church doctrine at, since the third century at, at, and cemented certainly by the fifth century. It absolutely is, and, and that's why it's so prevalent today. 
Uh, and so what we're doing is, again, we're focusing on no one comes to the Father but by me, what Jesus meant by that. So we want to, uh, as I indicated earlier, there are other scriptures that would appear to contradict that concept or that interpretation, so we want to investigate that. Now, the question I have for you, John, is there any incident in the ministry of Jesus where he directs this directly responds to this question about going to heaven. Okay, absolutely. There is a direct uh, in, a question and a direct answer. Uh, so we'll look at that. Okay. All right. We're in uh, Matthew 19. I'm going to read the whole account is uh, up to verse 22. I'll just read verse 16 and 17. And behold, one came to him, came to Jesus, and he said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain, obtain eternal life? Now, that's kind of plain, Ken. So you, we, we believe that any Christian uh, evangelical today would believe that this, this guy is actually asking, how do, I, how do I ensure that I can go to heaven? Right. When I die, I'm going to die one of these days. How do I, what do I have what he meant? Absolutely, that's what he was asking. Right. That's right. exactly what it says. So what was Jesus' response? And he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments? Keep the commandments. So that would, now, what is he saying? He, uh, if you have a biblical lifestyle, uh, Hey, you're going to stand before God and the biblical lifestyle will serve you well, uh, obeying the commandments. And the but, guy says, I'm already, I'm doing that. But why didn't, why didn't Jesus say, if you want inner life, you just follow me, believe in me and follow me because okay. I'm the way to the Father. Well, well, you see the obvious conflict uh, in Jesus' response and, uh, and the interpretation of the, the key scripture that we're looking at tonight, John 14, 6. Now, let's talk about this question of judgment. Did, did Jesus ever directly uh, address the issue of a judgment? We know, according to the book of Hebrews, that it's appointed once for man to die, and after that comes judgment. Did Jesus ever directly address the issue of judgment? Uh, he uh, does that also very directly now. In, you know, there's a thing, uh, uh, Jewish people... Uh, look at the Torah as uh, a little more weight than the prophets. Because God said, I'll talk to Moses face to face. I'll come to prophets in dreams and visions, talk to uh, Moses face to face. Uh, well, this is Jesus talking, you Amen. know? And so we have to interpret things like what Paul said or, or uh, around what Jesus said, because this is Jesus. This is right. And so let's go to John 5, verse 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who were in the tombs shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Those who good, did uh, good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So he's saying there quite directly, Ken, that you're going to be judged on what you did in this current life. All right? Uh, there's a book. The book is going to be open, the book of life, and you're going to be judged out of that. So, so uh, Jesus is maintained that we obtain eternal life by keeping the commandments and that we're going to be judged on the basis of what we do in this lifestyle. Well, according to Augustine, Jesus would be considered a heretic then. Well, that's pretty tough. It does appear that way, right. doesn't it? Right. What does, what does he actually mean by that statement? Well, it's a straightforward uh, interpretation. I mean, it's, it's, it's right out there. And so uh, it's hard to come down on a position, as the church has done, when there are strip scriptures uh, that seems to, uh, to conflict a, a with. A direct conflict. So therefore, we have to ask ourselves the question once again, just exactly what did Jesus mean when he said, no one can come to the Father but by me. What was he talking about? Uh, because we've already looked at scriptures that seem to, if, if we take the typical interpretation of it, that this is the key to go to heaven or avoid going to hell, uh, we've already found uh, Jesus' own words that directly conflict that. So what was he talking about? And we want to submit the thesis that Jesus was talking about becoming intimate with God. 
Right. And so we want to develop that concept. Right. Obviously, there was a fall in the garden, and Adam and Eve were kicked out. Now, they had perfect communion with God. As the Bible says, God came down in the cool of the day and sat around talking to them, and however that was, but that's the indication there. Now, they are separated from God, out of the garden, and uh, that communion with God is broken. So Jesus talks about having, uh, getting back that perfect intimacy with God that was lost in the fall. So it had nothing to do with heaven and hell, it was intimacy with God. So we're in the process of redemption and, and we, might call it, we might talk about restoration. And so uh, we want to then investigate, is there a biblical pattern of revelation concerning approaching God uh, for the purpose of being intimate with God? And we would like to suggest that there are a number of uh, such revelations that are right before us, and we're going to consider in particular, or first at least, the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness and the meaning and the, and the symbol, uh, symbol, uh, symbolism, I should say, of that tabernacle. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the tabernacle now on the screen, and I'll be explaining this uh, now, this is the tabernacle in the wilderness, and we've broken down the, uh, the inner court here. Uh, now, so w let's say, uh, uh, in the Holy of Holies, we have the throne of God. And between the two cherubim, if you remember the last verse in chapter 3 of, the, uh, uh, of, Ex of Genesis, the cherubim guarded the way to God. Here we can see uh, that in the tabernacle, the cherubim pointed to God on top of the uh, Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Okay, well, let's talk about the different chambers that are literally making up that thing and, and see how, what each chamber may represent. Okay, so the Holy of Holies represents the... Uh, uh, the actual throne of God, where the uh, God dwelt between the two cherubim, and uh, and then uh, we we look to the holy place as we're backing out of the uh, holy place here, and uh, th through the veil now we see the uh, holy place that represents the ministry of Messiah in this present age, which is building a bridge to mankind. Obviously, uh, uh, if we get to the courtyard, we see the levier that has the washing and the altar for the blood covering. But in the holy place itself, we see the uh, menorah, the light, and Jesus is the light of the world. And then we see the bread of presence. He is the manna from heaven and the altar of incense, which uh, represents the prayers of the saints coming before God. So, so we see everything has another me a meaning there, Ken. So, so you think that uh, you mentioned that uh, you felt felt that the uh, holy place uh, next to the holy of holies uh, was actually represents uh, the ministry of Messiah. So we see Jesus functioning in all of those all of those right. capacities. He ever lives to make intercession for us, right? And that's the altar of incense, and that's so, right. so everything we, in there. So we believe then that that God is like building from the His throne, which would represented by the most holy place. He's building a bridge to uh, unredeemed man and saying to man, "Now here is the means to approach or come to me." Now, let's look at our own experience relative to this picture, uh, and I think we can, in Messiah Jesus, we can see uh, our approach to God and begin to understand perhaps what Jesus said about no other way, no one comes to the Father but by me. This is the means of approach, because uh, when we look at that same diagram, we come to the uh, altar in the courtyard, and that was a place of the sprinkling of a blood a blood covering, and so we will sprinkle the blood of Jesus, so to speak, uh, in our lives, cleanse, and in our uh, approach, we come to the lavir, and the and Jesus said the lavir represents our uh, the worship by the word. And, and our renewing of our minds by God's scripture, that's just what we're doing now as we're studying the scriptures. Uh, we're having the mind of Messiah. And so we enter in then to the holy place 
uh, that is, we begin to function uh, in the Holy Spirit under the authority in Messiah Jesus, and and we are become participants with Jesus in as the light and as the bread and as in intercessions, the function of Messiah. And then finally, as we continue following Jesus, we sing that song, I have, to follow, I have decided to follow Jesus. Well, this is what he meant by I am the way. Uh, we follow him literally in Messiah Jesus. By faith, at least, we are located or positioned or seated uh, in the most holy place in the presence of God. So we find in the pattern of the tabernacle a straightforward meaning of uh, uh, approaching I, God. No one can come to the Father but by me. Now, mm -hmm. how about how about the Jewish liturgy uh, uh, in the in that era before Jesus? I did, did. Okay, so how were they restricted in that regard? Right. So the priests could enter into the holy place twice a day for the oil, uh, the menorah, and the table of showbread. Uh, they changed once a week at the altar of incense. But the high priest on Yom Kippur, Leviticus 16, can only enter into the Holy of Holies once a year uh, for his own sin and then, once a, and then for everyone else's and even the sin tendency. So Ken, uh, there wasn't that much intimacy. The high priest had some intimacy, but once a year. Oh, okay, so, so now if we can understand this in, in Jesus' mindset, now, everybody, everybody in the book of John, with the exception of Pilate, is Jewish. Jesus is talking to Jewish people. They know very well the liturgy of the temple or the tabernacle. They know very well that only the priest uh, uh, comes before the very throne of God for a few minutes. I don't know how long he actually stayed in there. But it's that one day. Is one day a year for a few minutes in one day of the year and one person out of all right. Israel. Now Jesus is saying, hey, I am the way. I am the way to intimacy with God. Yep. Here, here no, one, no one actually can come into this thing except by me. He was talking about in intimacy. Now, when we go the next step in prophecy, and, and uh, we look at the prophecies concerning the new creation, we can see it in both the pr prophetic book of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation. Uh, the ultimate uh, end is the, what John would call the city of New Jerusalem. And, and the city of New Jerusalem is just the most holy place. There, there is no, there, this outer chamber that we saw in right. the tabernacle is not there. It's just the holy place, and in that most holy place is the Holy One Himself and the Lamb. Right. Now, we talk about the streets of gold and all of that, but the truth is uh, believers actually make up uh, the new city, Jerusalem. The foundation stones are the apostles, and we as believers are living stones, living, and, and, and in us is the very presence of God. That's what worship is supposed to be in the church. Right. So, so uh, there we are, and then so that leads us then uh, to uh, to the sacrifices. Ken, we want to talk about that. What is the purpose of the sacrifices? Some may think it means appeasing God, uh, wrath of God, or whatever. No, it had nothing. It has to do with exactly what we're talking about. Uh, the word is used for offering, and, and, and uh, it's most often offering in the beginning of the book of Leviticus, first six chapters, uh, the offering is korban. It comes from the Hebrew word karav, which means to approach or to draw near. So the whole idea of the sacrifices is a covering for your sins so you could draw near to God. So it's not appeasing God. No, so that he won't be angry with you Sin anymore. separates us from God, and now God so, gave a way that we can get up and approach him again. So, so, so again, we are talking about how God is outlining patterns that we may approach uh, for the purpose of being intimate with him for whatever reason God desires that we as in the human community are intimate with him. And so he's provided a pattern of revelation uh, toward intimacy, and that's exactly what Jesus was talking about on the night before he was crucified. Now, if we look at these approaches, and that's what, they, that's what 
the literal meaning of korban and karav are the approaches to God. We have uh, five steps, five sequence of uh, approaches, and they must be taken in proper order. The first is the tras trespass offering, and in the trespass offering, we're talking about uh, making, uh, uh, repaying uh, the person that we have uh, stolen from or whatever the transgression was. And then a blood offering uh, uh, on the altar, a covering of sin. I have given you the blood on the altar for a covering of your sin. We have second, the chata or the sin offering. And the sin offering is where we've just transgressed or missed the mark is literally what it means. Uh, miss being and doing what God is being and doing. And then we have the uh, thanksgiving or peace, the shalomit, the peace offering, uh, uh, which means that we're just celebrating communion with God, uh, having dinner at his house, basically, in the simplest terms. The next is the mincha or the gift offering, uh, uh, there, there we're actually beginning to function in God's purpose, obedience. Follow, uh, Jesus said, my meat is to do my Father's will, and this is what he was talking about. And then the final offering is the burnt offering, uh, which in Hebrew is the olah, which literally means going up. Uh, uh, being in the yeah, the same ultimate, root as El Al, or uh, same uh, same uh, same exactly, Aliyah rather the same same concept exactly going up um, uh, ultimate in communion with God. So we we find this sequence. We deal with sin. Uh, we come to grips with uh, having communion or peace with God. We consecrate our lives to God more and more and more, and ultimately go up to be with God. It's a perfect. Uh, a picture to of God. approaching God. So even the sacrifices point to approaching God. The the outline of the tabernacle points to approaching God, uh, uh, and the sacrifices speak of it approaching God. So we could see that the whole idea here is intimacy with God. What we lost in the garden, uh, the, uh, the Adam, the first man. <laughs> Uh, uh, the second, as Paul would write, Romans 5. That's right. Uh, has brought that back. And now, Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. So that's the only reason those sacrifices would work in the first place, uh, because uh, Jesus paid the price. But uh, they do work. The point is that you uh, that uh, the uh Intimacy with God is what he was talking about. So, so if we look at the revelation that God brought to Israel, we have God saying, build me a house that I may dwell in the midst of you. So there was a dimension of intimacy with God in the midst of Israel. Now Jesus is saying, hey, we're taking one giant super step forward in this issue of intimacy. I am the way, the truth, the life. This is the way that you come to the Father. Right. That is intimacy. You know, Ken, I'm uh, taking a group up to Israel soon, and sometimes we visit the churches in Nazareth and in uh, uh, Bethlehem and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and you see there's a lot of ritual and guys in black robes with altars of incense, with incense uh, hanging down. And that's not what God was talking about it with intimacy. That's taking some of the Jewish customs that God ordained for Israel uh, and mapping them over into a church stuff. Uh, uh, r just ritual. God desires in Messiah that we have that intimacy with God and the church uh, uh, ignoring that and just saying everybody's going to hell has greatly limited uh, the opportunity for ministry, yeah. especially in these uh, last days right. uh, with Israel. So, they, so the church fathers throughout the, throughout the centuries have created a religion that basically says that uh, in absolute contradiction to Jesus' uh, own words that says be a part of the church and you'll be exempt from responsibility yeah. before God. Yeah, we'll baptize your babies and they'll be safe too. That's right. And and uh, uh, the, the law is only apple to Israel. It doesn't mean anything to us. Uh, well, it's uh, legalism anyway. It's just legalism. It has has really nothing to do with the real questions that we're dealing with. Here. Right. 
And so, and so through the traditions of man uh, implemented through Christianity, the words and the teaching and the very revelation of Jesus has been virtually nullified. And yeah. it, is a, it is an awesome transgression. Uh, and, and as you indicated, John, we're, we're, we're about in the time period we see every indication uh, prof prophetic-wise that we're in the last days. This is a serious time. Israel has been regathered. The world is is uh, once again in a position that, that uh, it could create a global government like Babel. Uh, we're approaching the times of Noah. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a time to be uh, straight with the scriptures. It's time to get real with the Bible and, and uh, throw these uh, church tradition, which are obviously unscriptural, over the side. Uh, you, know, you don't need them anymore. We want, we want to invite you to uh, come uh, to Fellowship Church to join our work. Uh, we have labored in this work for decades, and the Lord has greatly blessed us. Uh, we want to invite you to come and, and join that work. Uh, check us out. Join that work. Join our classes. You can, you can do our Zamok courses uh, here locally on our campus, but you can also do it online. Uh, if you're seeing this program online in somewhere uh, distant from Orlando, you can do that. Join these classes and study. Uh, uh, they're very, very important. Our, our first year class is now studying in Genesis, meets on Monday night. And then finally John's getting ready, and this is the ultimate field trip for the uh, church and for the institute, going up to the land. John's taking a group in less than a month now, I guess. Yeah, we're leaving at the end of October, but you could meet us in... Tel Aviv, our first night, and go from there. So uh, write in, call us, uh, and, uh, and uh, we, we welcome, we still have room on the bus. So uh, that's our program for this evening. Shalom.